All right, welcome everyone. My name is Eric Kolachik. I'm a director of the Hurry Institute for Computing here at Boston University, and we're really delighted to welcome everyone here. Hurry Institute is dedicated to leading integrated initiatives in research and technology development, targeting a broad set of disciplines at the nexus of the computational and data sciences. We have core strengths in cloud computing, security, data privacy, and artificial intelligence, as well as a network of over 275 research affiliates across a vast spectrum of disciplines. Hurry Institute's goal is to positively impact people everywhere through our research. Next slide, please. So today's event is a culmination of what we call focused research programs here at the university. These are year long programs. The mission of these programs is to evolve and advance Boston University's research in computing and data science around areas of strategic importance and emerging opportunity. Programs are designed to facilitate research convergence by providing what we call scaffolding for groups to coalesce in sustainable ways with the goal of accelerating research for broader impact. All right, so I want to uh, just quickly introduce the symposium leadership, and these are also leadership of the Focus Research Program. I also want to thank our co-sponsors. So today's event is co-sponsored by the BU College of Engineering and the BU College of Arts and Sciences. It's also co-sponsored by the Department of Material Science and Engineering and the Department of Chemistry. So the leaders for today are uh, Emily Ryan and Aaron Beeler. A uh, brief word about each. Emily is an associate professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and the Division of Material Science and Engineering. She's also a founding faculty member of BU's Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences and an associate director of the Institute for Sustainable Energy at BU. Erin is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and a core faculty member of the Center for Molecular Discovery at BU. His research interests span chemical synthesis and methodology with a focus on using and enabling technologies. So at this point, uh, I want to thank both of them for uh, all their leadership pulling this together. Uh, and I'm going to turn over to Aaron to uh, begin taking us through the program. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you for the introduction and thank uh, everyone for taking time to <clears throat> join us for the symposium. Uh, just a little bit of an overview of this FRP, uh, just to sort of set the stage for the for the symposium broadly. Um, the, the the general goal and the title, uh, Machine Learning for Chemistry and Material Science, uh, with the general goal being to advance uh, the design and synthesis of small molecules and materials uh, using machine learning. And those are both very broad topics, but I, I think that was uh, purposeful in the design and really trying to find the ways in which uh, chemistry uh, and chemical sciences interfaces with machine learning. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I, I just really wanted to uh, give a, a, a shout out to the um, core faculty uh, that are involved with the FRP and facilitating this, this program this year. Um, and, and certainly this is an outstanding uh, uh, grouping of, of faculty, of, of excellent faculty. But what I really wanna point out here is uh, the, the diversity with regards to the departments uh, that, that these faculty come from. I, I, would, I would say this is really just an exceptional uh, 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 swath of, of, of departments and, and, and focus uh, with regard to research uh, that's involved in, in, this, in this FRP. Uh, we have people from math stats, chemistry, uh, material science and engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, electrical and computer engineering, uh, which is really, again, just, I, I think, very exciting and outstanding. Uh, and fairly unique, I, I, would, I would argue, to have uh, such a wide range of, of faculty participation. Uh, on the next slide, uh, just to give you again a little bit of an overview of, of this FRP. <clears throat> uh, so we, we, we had three focuses or, or as we called them thrusts and, and, and you can imagine that uh, looking at this, this kind of, uh, we have uh, two thrusts that are really experimental in nature. Uh, one looking at ways in which machine learning can uh, facilitate uh, modeling and simulation of complex interfaces. Uh, which was led by Emily, um, one in which we are looking at ways in, to uh, uh, facilitate data generation uh, and, and prediction of, of chemical reactions uh, through high throughput reaction screening, 
uh, which was uh, a thrust that I was involved in. And, and the second is, or the third is, is looking at ways in which machine learning can facilitate theory uh, of, of, of chemical sciences, uh, which was led by uh, David Coker. Uh, and again, so we have a very wide range of, of expertise here, a wide range of, 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 uh, looking, at, uh, of looking at machine learning and, and chemical sciences, uh, and a very exciting sort of interplay between these three, these three thrusts. Um, and on the next slide, we will uh, overview the, uh, the agenda. Uh, so um, obviously we've already gone through the introduction with Eric and thank you, Eric. Uh, and then we will move into the first session. Uh, and I would like to note that the sessions one, two, and three, uh, while they're not exact uh, replicas of these thrusts, uh, they are, are uh, thematically related to each of the thrusts. And we really tried to make sure that these thrusts were represented in these sessions. Um, and so in session one, uh, we're going to look at machine learning and experimental and uh, chemical material sciences. And, and each, each session will be uh, uh, ended with a uh, panel discussion. Um, and so uh, you can look forward to, to utilizing that time for, for discussion and questions. Uh, and we will then uh, move on to a launch session where there will be posters uh, largely from students in the community. Uh, so I hope everyone can stay and really uh, take the time to uh, talk to the students uh, in this poster session. I think there's a lot of very exciting research there. Um, in session two, we're going to be looking at machine learning uh, innovation to support uh, chem chemistry and material sciences. So this is really largely uh, uh, revolving around the thrust with, uh, from Emily Ryan, uh, looking at uh, inter inter interfaces and, and, and simulation and modeling. Uh, and then we're going to have a short break uh, for about 15 minutes, depending on uh, our, our time, our timekeeping, and followed with our final uh, session, which is machine learning and computational chemicals and material science. This is really uh, looking at theory, uh, and um, um, and then followed by the closing remarks. And again, each of these are uh, are ended by a panel. Uh, and, and hopefully, again, depending on our timing and our closing remarks, we'll have a little bit of a discussion around some of the major uh, uh, points uh, that we take home points that we can we can uh, discuss. So uh, we, we hope to stay on time. So thank you very much. And uh, again, I, I just wanted to, to bring a, a focus on the uh, poster session. Uh, you will have to leave the Zoom uh, meeting uh, and, and then using Chrome or Firefox log, log into GatherTown. GatherTown is a, a, a platform for, for, the, for poster sessions and other things that uh, will allow you to sort of navigate around and interact with people, but also interact with the poster preventers. Um, and, and so the first thing you need to do is log in using the link provided. And I would like to also point out that our, our uh, panel or our, our session moderator for this first session, Malika Jeffries L, will uh, also give you this information right before the poster session. So you don't have to uh, remember all of this. Um, and once you're into the link, you'll uh, set up, make sure you allow uh, mic and video access. You'll create an avatar with a name. Please use your first and last name. Um, and and I, just as a, as, a, as a reminder, to, if you do have issues, try to refresh your, uh, your browser. Um, and so uh, in the next, um, in the next, so uh, you can sort of move around this, this, uh, this platform using your, either your, your a, uh, WASD keys or your arrows, and you'll just walk up to a poster uh, and you can press the X and this will allow you to start to interact. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, straightforward. I think it's very intuitive. So I, 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 hopefully you will have very, very uh, few issues. Uh, this is a list and a positioning of the posters that will be presented, uh, again, largely from students in the community. Uh, so again, hopefully you will have time to uh, check them all out. I will also note that there is a limit on the number of people per poster. So if the poster that you want to look at at the time is, is full, please move on to another one so we can actually uh, uh, facilitate uh, uh, the opportunity to, to see them all. Um, and moving on to the next uh, slide, um, uh, I would like to move into uh, uh, introducing our first session. Uh, so again, this is machine learning and experimental and chemical and material sciences. Um, 
And I'm going to briefly introduce each of the speakers because uh, to again, facilitate quick transition, we will not do a, a, a significant introduction for each speaker uh, between uh, talks. Um, and so this, this session is really focused on experimental methods to generate robust uh, data for mostly for chemical reactions that can be uh, uh, appropriate for machine learning and optimization. And, and this is really a, a very large challenge uh, and how, how we, can, we can generate this data. And I think each of these, each of these speakers will have a, a different take and a different approach towards this. Our first speaker is uh, Connor Coley, uh, assistant professor at MIT. Uh, and our second speaker will be Carrie Gilmore, a assistant professor at the University of uh, 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 Connecticut uh, in the Department of Chemistry. And our third uh, speaker is Grace Russell, who is a scientist at Snapdragon Chemistry. I'm looking forward to hearing all three of these talks. Um, and so we will move on. I, I, one, one last thing before we get started. Um, our, our panel, our, our session moderator, again, this, this, this round is uh, Malika Jeffries L, uh, Jeff, Jeffries L, who is a uh, uh, associate professor in chemistry here at uh, BU, who really represents the material side of, of, of all of these discussions. Um, and I uh, look forward to hearing her thoughts uh, during the panel session. Um, so with that, we will move on to, I believe, our first speaker. And just a reminder to hold questions through the Q&A until the end. Let me get my screen up. So, well, thank you, Aaron and to the other organizers for the invitation to be here. Um, it's, it's really great to virtually get to share some perspectives on organic reaction developments, um, again, with an emphasis on how it is enabled or facilitated through the use of automation, as well as the use of data science. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump straight into sort of my motivation for working in this field, uh, just to provide a little bit more context. So uh, chemical synthesis is really this component in the broader ecosystem of scientific discovery, right? And when we're trying to discover some new functional molecule or material, which, which is the focus of the sort of Harini Institute, we're going to be going through some iterative design cycles almost, almost always. And when we're trying to discover these new compounds, we of course need to synthesize them in order to test them experimentally. And so synthesis becomes a quite important bottleneck in this overall discovery process. And while we of course also need to worry about synthesis at much later stages for manufacturing, I'd argue that synthesis during discovery is a, a bigger challenge just because of the diversity of compounds that we might want to make at that stage. And so we can turn to techniques in sort of automation and artificial intelligence to help us. Um, and I also wanna say that artificial intelligence and automation can help us in much broader ways, right? So um, I really see the role of these techniques as helping us make decisions throughout the entire scientific process. So in research, right, we constantly make these trade-offs between the value of information that we'll get by running a certain experiment and the cost of running that experiment or the cost of obtaining that information. And so there's an opportunity to make these trade-offs more quantitative and systematic. And we'll see that manifested in a few different ways through a few different questions we might be asking in early stage chemical development. So a few specific questions we might ask would include, um, if I've got a single step reaction and I would like to optimize it to achieve the highest yields, what experimental conditions should I use? A second question might be, if I'm trying to not optimize the reaction, but rather build a model, right? Increase my understanding of chemical reactivity, which experiments are the best to run in that case? And then this third question we might ask is, when faced with a completely new molecule that's never been made, how do I make it, right? What is the, the recipe or the routes to produce it? Now, there are of course many, many more sort of questions we can ask and questions we can turn to data science and automation to help us answer. But for at least these three, we're reliant on our ability to generate and learn from chemical reaction data. And so that's really where, in my opinion, high throughput screening starts to come into play. Right, so high throughput screening, we're really trying to run experiments for information. And there've been a number of different advances that let us generate information more quickly and with less material consumption. And again, because our goal is really information, 
we should be trying to make as little material as possible, right? Just what we need for analysis. And so it's becoming increasingly common to run experiments in these microvials, right? Where maybe we have less than 100 microliters or less than 50 or even smaller numbers. Because all we need is enough to analyze. And typical, typically these analytical methods um, focus on liquid chromatography and mass spec, right? There are other techniques that can be used and there are other techniques that are used widely at BU, I know, using sort of IR to help sort of monitor reaction progress. But these are the workhorses for chemical reaction screening, in my opinion. And so if we use liquid chromatography, maybe it takes us one minute to get some quantitative readout. And so that sort of sets our throughput, one minute per instrument we purchase. If we just use sort of mass spec alone, right, sort of just be a little bit more choosy about our analytical techniques, have a little bit lower fidelity, we can achieve much, much higher throughput and screen, start to screen thousands of reactions per hour. So again, parallel reaction screening typically looks something like this schematic on the right. right? So here we're just running 96 at a time. We could of course run many more. But we prepare our sort of crude reaction mixtures using robotic liquid handlers. We need to seal up the system and we need to heat it and then we need to analyze um, the results of those reactions. And so there's one very small point to clarify here, which is that admittedly, right, these systems aren't always automated. You know, automation isn't a necessity for high throughput reaction screening by any means. But I think it's important to note that in many of these workflows, there is this manual step of at the very least, you know, screwing down this top plate so we mitigate evaporative loss, right? We can run at higher temperatures without losing all of our material through evaporation. So this isn't really a significant limitation in the grand scheme of things, but um, it's an important caveat. And I think it's also one of the motivators for thinking about reaction screening in flow, right? So we don't have to use these batch vessels, right? These vials or well plates to run these chemical reactions. We can also think about flow chemistry. And I know that you'll be hearing much more about flow chemistry in the next couple of talks as well from Carrie and Grace. So flow systems are typically sealed and they're typically run at elevated pressures. So we don't have to worry so much about evaporative losses, right? We can minimize the number of manual steps it takes to run different reactions under different conditions. And so again, rather than using these sort of batch flasks, we run things in continuous flow in these tubes often with uh, small characteristic length scales on the order of millimeters. We can run continuous flow or if we co-pump an immiscible solvent, we can have a segmented flow. And if we just have a single reaction droplet that we actually care about, we can just have a single 15 microliter slug, they're sometimes called, in this stream of otherwise immiscible liquid. Now there are sort of a variety of benefits for, um, uh, of flow chemistry, right? When we're thinking about automation and reaction screening. It's pretty straightforward to change the flow rates of uh, these, these solutions using computer controlled pumps. So that changes the residence time or the reaction time. We can easily use heaters to change the reaction conditions. And so it makes it relatively easy to map out this parameter space without having different reaction vessels, right? We simply change the pumps that are pumping through this sort of tube, which is our reactor. There's also inherent benefits to scale it, which you may or may not hear about again in the next, next couple of talks. So with these batch systems, right, focused on microvials or the flow systems based on miniaturizations and very small tubes, we can perform large scale screening studies with thousands of reactions to try to understand the influence of different input parameters on reaction performance. So here's a couple of examples, the first from Abby Doyle at Princeton, second from Neil Sack at Pfizer. And so this first one in the upper left is plate-based, right? So it's a plate-based screen uh, using batch vessels where many different combinations of substrates, additives, catalysts, and bases were varied to make different products. And the yields were quantified for each of these reactions. So we measured the performance of the reactions. In the flow system, right in the bottom right, this is a case where they use sort of the segmented flow paradigm where you have a, a single reaction droplet that we track and analyze. Here, they varied a number of different aspects of the reaction conditions and leaving groups, but they were making the same product. Now, the point of these dense screens, and there are more and more that emerge in the literature all the time, is really to provide a comprehensive map right, of how changing the conditions might influence the performance of the reaction. Right? So the goal is really throughput. Right? The goal is running hundreds or thousands of reactions 
in a few hours, right, to get this complete understanding of the landscape. And we can very easily, on top of this data, train machine learning models that then correlate descriptors of the inputs to the reaction performance, right? Reaction performance is often the yield in this case. But depending on the goal, that's actually not terribly efficient, right? So exhaustive screening will try out a lot of different combinations of conditions, but sometimes we don't actually care about how the inputs affect the output. So in a purely engineering or application focused context, maybe we only care about optimizing the reaction. So we just want to know what are the conditions that maximize the yield, right? How do I maximize the productivity of my system? Now for this goal, there are a number of different techniques for iterative experimental design or active learning, right? So, and the idea is that instead of having this comprehensive scan over all of our different input parameters, all these different dimensions, we instead use algorithms to interactively navigate the design space and select which experiments to perform on the basis of experiments that were previously performed. So we run some reactions, we train a model, we use that model to motivate the selection of new experiments and we repeat that cycle. And so this, this paradigm of closed loop optimization has been around for some time, as we'll see. Um, it's, it's become quite popular in the last decade to use flow chemistry for this closed loop optimization again, because of the ease of changing the flow rates of pumps, the ease of changing temperatures, and the ease of sampling using inline valves rather than taking aliquots, right? Fewer moving parts to worry about. So I'll just mention a few examples from, from the Jensen lab at MIT. Um, you know, these, these systems have been used to optimize the yields of chemical reactions just by changing concentrations and temperatures, optimizing for discrete variables like solvents or catalysts or uh, catalysts and bases, right? So there's a number of different applications of these closed loop algorithms where we simply try to identify the optimal conditions in the fewest numbers of experiments, right? And of course, there's been some novelty uh, with respect to both the hardware that we use to run the reactions on demand and the software that we use to guide them. It's worth mentioning um, that there are examples from decades ago that already kind of used this paradigm, right? So these, these weren't flow chemistry examples, but here's a 1978 example from uh, SmithKlein, right? So pre, pre Glaxo, which used a stirred tank reactor, sampled from it, performed liquid chromatography automatically and decided what concentrations and temperatures to use for the next experiment. So this wasn't miniature and it wasn't high throughput, but it was closed loop reaction optimization, right? They were selecting experiments to maximize the performance of their chemical reaction without human intervention. And so in many ways, the goals of what we do often hasn't changed, but the hardware and the software has gotten a little bit more sophisticated and certainly a whole lot easier to implement these algorithms on, on modern computing hardware. And this, this framework of iterative optimization um, doesn't really just have to be to optimize the yield, right? We can optimize for information as well. And so here's an example from Natalie Ike, looking at trying to choose the best experiments to run to maximize information, right? So we're using this retrospective study of high throughput reaction screening data this was data from Merck that was obtained using uh, dense reaction screening, I believe in 384 or 1536 well planes. So very, very small uh, scale reaction screening. What Natalie showed was that if you are sort of uh, intentional about the experiments you select and you're not just randomly performing different combinations of bases and temperatures and concentrations, then for the same budget of experiments, you can produce a much more performance and predictive model, right? So we can much more efficiently build these accurate models of chemical reactivity by using these high throughput platforms in a clever way. If we think about moving from this sort of single step reaction paradigm where we're screening one, one reaction step at a time and really just trying to build a model or optimize the yields to multi-step reaction planning, things get a little bit trickier. So in multi-step planning, if we're trying to synthesize completely novel compounds, there are many more unknowns we have to deal with. We have to think about what reaction types to use, what starting materials to use, what reaction conditions to try to test. And so for this goal, we and others have worked on uh, many different sort of data-driven techniques that look at databases of organic reactions and learn from the transformations that they describe. 
right? So we look at millions of published chemical reactions. We try to infer patterns and apply them to new molecules. And so there's uh, certainly not enough time to describe in detail how any of these models work, but I'll just briefly mention that we've built right, a variety of machine learning models on organic reaction data to do things like synthesis planning, recommending reaction conditions and predicting the products of chemical reactions even. And we've integrated them into open source software tools. Now the point of sort of talking about this as a slight diversion is to say that we can bring together the sort of data science methods and the screening even more intimately than what, what you've already seen. So one of the areas where ASCOS and automation intersect was in this proof of concept demonstration now a couple of years ago, showing that we could take these planned synthetic routes from the AI program, right? Again, that had been trained on the literature. We could execute them on a robotic flow platform. Now there was an essential middle step here. So I want to emphasize that this was not, not fully automated. There's a whole lot more than screwing down the top plate that we had to do. But to expert flow chemists, had to refine the suggestions to at the very least ensure that we wouldn't clog the flow reactor platform, right? But we take the process as planned by the AI, we then do a little bit of manual offline optimization and then we submit it to the robotic platform for execution. And I'll just show the first 30 or 45 seconds or so of a video um, demonstrating the synthesis of lidocaine, which again uses the proposed route, which has since been refined by experts and then put onto the system. And so what you see in the video is that the robotic arm you know, grabs uh, chemical reactors from the right-hand side. It, it grabs the different modules that it needs for this flow process. So an outlet, here a liquid-liquid separator, that is going to grab two reactors, one three milliliter reactor and a one milliliter reactor. Once it's done that, it makes the fluidic connections using a switchboard-like approach. So it's going to route tubes from the pumps and sock solutions over to the reactor inlets. Once it's done with that, it's going to automatically seal everything and start running and producing live again. Ding. No. Yeah. So in my opinion, this is this is really the future of automated synthesis, right? This this integration of AI guided experiments and using these automated platforms to perform and optimize chemical reactions um, using sort of increasingly um, sort of automated algorithms for experimental design. Uh, so I'm out of time, and I'll just close then by thanking you know everyone who's who's um, had their hands in this work and who I've talked to about these concepts over the years. Um, you know, in particular, I'll, I'll point you to a few review articles if you are interested in diving a little bit more deeply into these topics. But uh, thank you again for the invitation, and very much looking forward to discussion later on the panel. Thank you. For that, Connor. <clears throat> so yes, we'll keep questions to the end of the all of the sessions, and we'll do them at the panel. So we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Carrie Gilmore from the Department of Chemistry, University of Connecticut. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the the invitation. I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of this uh, really exciting session and a uh, member of these really wonderful talks. Um, what we're going to be, be talking about today is how we can facilitate chemical synthesis. Um, and if we're going to improve how we do something, we must first understand how that something works. Uh, we typically, in making small molecules, do this in a stepwise fashion. We have a series of, of reactions, which we obsessively optimize, we isolate intermediates, and we go after our single targets. There's a lot of versatility in what we've been able to, to achieve and develop in these processes. We can incorporate technology in order to improve how we do this at times uh, when necessary. Uh, we can also link multiple steps together to then have uh, multi-step processes that can minimize the number of, of physical steps we need to do. Um, and then with each new step, we then develop a new process and continue to um, develop regardless of the, the similarities of these types of molecules. And in this, um, in this we, we have some limitations. It's a fairly inefficient means of, of developing. Um, it's a, uh, generally speaking, as a kind of a broader community sense, it is still very much a physical skill-based system. We have to be very talented in how we are performing our chemistry in order to have reproducibility and to develop our processes. 
the way that we approach this is also still a trial and error um, basis in what conditions that we choose in order to optimize our, our process fees. We need to figure out how we can approach this and develop these things because we've done well for ourselves, even with these limitations. Obviously, there's a, uh, beautifully complex molecules and, and efficient process that we've developed, um, but we can do better. Um, in order to do that, we have to change how we approach chemical synthesis in general, how we build our understanding. And we must change how that we collectively perform chemistry, not just the techniques that we use, but how we as a community perform chemical research. And so if we look at, and we're able to do this, we'll kind of look at three different um, aspects of chemical synthesis in general, how we, we perform our chemical reactions, what reactions that we're actually doing in, in the lab, and then we'll see where we can take this um, next and in the, the very near future. And for all of these different aspects, we need to make sure that we're focusing on those weaknesses of our, our traditional approach. Um, very briefly, I'll, I'll talk about kind of how we can minimize the, the physical skills required and how we can accelerate our chemical synthesis in, in general. Um, Connor did a fantastic job in introducing flow chemistry in, in general. Um, I mean, batch processes are wonderful because they are standardized. Every chemical synthesis lab in the world has a, a series of, of brown bottom flasks. Uh, and for a lot of chemistries, this works very well. We can then add our uh, reagents in here. We can apply our conditions to that solution uh, and out the other side. The problem is that uh, for some processes which are more sensitive, uh, we have issues with reproducibility with uh, the utilization of this, this equipment. And we obviously we have to be at our, um, at our bench in order to utilize this equipment. The alternative is something called flow chemistry. Um, and just from a very conceptual basis, the, the difference here is that we have a stable set of conditions through which we pass our reagents. And that difference kind of a, passing through conditions as opposed to applying conditions to something um, really in, enhances how we can perform our chemical reactions, at least for a, a fairly broad range of, of chemistries. We increase safety. We, really the, the advantage from an understanding perspective is the reproducibility aspect. And so we can trust the, the results that we come from this and not have to immediately blame that, you know, it was raining today and I sneezed in my reaction, everything went terribly. Um, it's also a process that is, is more easily automated. Um, there's certainly some, some very nice examples um, of how we can automate batch processes. Um, but from flow, as, as Connor mentioned, that we have much more, uh, we can much more easily tune the conditions and screen through processes more rapidly uh, using flow techniques. Um, we have um, developed in, in our lab uh, ways that we can automate and facilitate synthesis. Um, this uh, um, is something we call a, a radial synthesizer. And the difference is, as opposed to a traditional approach, we then have a linear series of, of steps. What we have is a series of stable reaction conditions that are all equally accessible to that central uh, core unit. And what we can then do is access any types of, of conditions that we want in any order that we want as many times as we want. And what that allows us to do is to really have a wide range of, of flexibility in the type of chemistries that we want to perform without ever having to physically change the system. And so we can operate this thing completely remotely without having to have anyone actually come in and replace different um, reactors or, or units. Um, as an example of this, uh, we can look at a uh, synthesis of a drug called rufinamid. Um, and let's say we not only want to make this, but we want to then make different versions of this. Um, how, do we, how do we synthesize this? There's lots of different ways. Uh, we can make this in a convergent route. Uh, so we can then make uh, two intermediates, in this case, the uh, azide and alkyne, and we can bring these uh, two intermediates together to form our, our key heterocycle. We could also make this in a, in a linear fashion. Uh, and so we can start from the right and move all the way towards our, our final product. And with this one system, we can now directly compare the efficiencies of, of both of these routes 
on that same instrument using the, the, same, uh, the same solutions. What if we want more though? Uh, what if we want to make whole libraries of these types of compounds or to screen and find more active uh, substances? Well, we can do this by then choosing which path is the most efficient means of synthesizing these different derivatives. If we want to uh, modify the left half of this molecule, we can then synthesize this in a convergent route because where we only have two potential re um, reactions we have to re-optimize. Whereas the right-hand side, we have three consecutive steps we might have to change in order to make this, these classes of compounds. And so then by, by accessing different starting materials in our uh, system, you can then make a whole range of compounds this way. If we look at functionalization of the, the right half of this molecule, well, if we start from our convergent route on the left, we then have two uh, steps we might have to, to re-optimize. Whereas on the right-hand side, that reagent is coming at the last step of our process. And so then we're going to utilize our, our linear route towards synthesis, and we can then make a class of, of derivatives this way. And we can then also make mixed uh, derivatives as well from that linear path. And so we can then make whole libraries of compounds using different synthetic routes, all without actually physically touching the instrument itself. Um, so the, with these types of, of tools in hand, what we really need to think about is what do we do? How do we develop these types of chemistries and how we can um, uh, accelerate the rate that we can um, choose which molecules to, to make? Um, and for this, we need to better understand our, our chemical reactions and how we actually build that understanding. For example, if we wanted to, to couple these two uh, units together, these two uh, sugar molecules, we bring together this uh, OH the alcohol with our uh, electrophile on the left. We could do that in two different ways. This could approach from the, the top half of this molecule or it could approach from the bottom. And that gives us two different um, anomers of our product, two different versions of this. Is there a way that we can, simply by selecting the reaction conditions, get this reaction to go one way versus another? If we understand the factors that are influenced in this reaction, we should be able to select out and give us a, a, a route towards either one of these two products without having to modify the starting materials themselves. How do we do this? Um, well, if we look at um, these types of, of very sensitive reactions, we need to be running these in, in flow so that we have that reproducibility. This is a, a different platform that we have uh, developed for this. Um, that we can quickly screen through uh, single step reactions. Um, and with uh, these types of uh, systems, we now have to choose what we're going to investigate. Um, and as a chemist guided system, it's actually tricky because we select out individual uh, factors. We can, for example, look at different groups on, um, on your starting materials to try to figure out what influence these have. You know, in green, this doesn't do anything really to our selectivity. But if we now change a different group on this molecule, we can then um, systematically improve our, our selectivity towards the um, target anomer in this case. And we can even identify and, and really pin down exactly what is, is happening here. In this case, uh, the formation of this type of stabilized intermediate. We can observe this uh, using cryogenic vibrational spectroscopy. And so we can understand exactly what is happening with this thing. The problem is, is that that is one aspect of this reaction um, that works in this case under these types of conditions. And you can imagine there's a lot of variables that can influence any one of our, our chemical reactions. How can we do this more efficiently? Um, because for chemical reactions, and particularly for, for glycosylations, there's a continuum that these uh, reactions work on from a mechanistic perspective. If you look at this single process, this actually goes through basically every type of reaction mechanism from SN2 to SN1, all happening simultaneously. And depending on the exact conditions you choose, you have lots of different types of intermediates, different conformations of intermediates in how we can get to these types of products. So it's a really messy reaction to try to piece out as, um, as an individual user. So we look at um, different factors that can influence this. You have ones that are built into our, your reaction pairs. 
You have the environmental factors that you can choose in order to get your reactions to, to work. Um, and all of this is, is 11 or, or 13 different factors that are influencing this reaction. How do we do this? Because we need to be able to quantify these values in order to understand and extrapolate it out from this. Um, we use computational chemistry in order to, to model these, to gain uh, descriptors of exactly what is influencing this reaction. That allows us to map out our chemical subspace uh, in order to see the actual relation between these types of uh, molecules. Um, and also allows us to pick out which reactions we should, we should test in order to push the, our understanding of this model. For example, one sugar derivative falls fairly within our training set, is not really pushing our understanding, whereas another occupies more of a dark space within our chemical subspace. And so that is the types of uh, reagents we want to choose in order to, to solidify our understanding of this type of reaction. We can train then um, machine learning models that can give us this, this understanding and that allows us to predict the uh, outcome of this reaction, in this case, the, the seroselectivity of our reaction. With these, these types of tools, where do we go with this? Um, so we have platforms, we have techniques. Where are we going in the, the near future for this? How do we increase the rate that we can do chemistry? Um, one of the, the ways we can do this is high throughput experimentation, but we can also then have blended data sets in order to do this. We can utilize our trained models to then predict all of the types of reactions that fall within that space that we have looked at from a statistical perspective such that we don't have to experimentally run all of these. We can then uh, validate certain points experimentally in order to validate these types of, of data sets and use these as um, now blended data sets to retrain our, our models and to uh, better understand these, these types of chemical spaces. We can also change the way that we develop our uh, targets for these models. So if we look at glycosylations, which is admittedly a fairly niche part of, of chemistry, Really what we have here is the formation of a stabilized carbocation, and we're controlling the facial selectivity of our nucleophile approach and controlling that, uh, that approach angle. There's a whole range of chemistries that fall within the same type of um, kind of uncontrolled mechanistic pathways. And so if we can design our um, and train our models based from a mechanistic perspective, not necessarily from a specific reaction perspective, we can then utilize this understanding and transfer this to a much broader range of, of chemistries, looking at not just stereoselectivity, but also regioselectivity. Um, and finally, what we want to, to be able to do is to improve the way that we as a community perform synthesis. It's all well and good if I have a fancy um, automated platform in my lab that doesn't really help the broader community. Um, but because these are remotely accessible, because we don't need to reconfigure these between different processes, we can then open up this, this um, hardware to then have networks of these automated platforms that we can then continue to, to access and develop and utilize not just for development of synth uh, synthetic processes, but also our understanding utilizing uh, machine learning um, capabilities. And this is something um, we're building with um, Gabriel Gomez, uh, who's gonna be a uh, professor at Carnegie Mellon uh, this winter. Um, with that, I'd like to, to thank the collaborators, particularly the, the people that we have uh, worked on this from um, Max Planck Institute, where I, I was previously and now uh, the team that we were building at UConn. Um, you have to excuse the, the lack of, of group picture as we haven't actually gotten together yet. Um, as you can see my hastily decorated office that I have behind me. Um, thank you very much for, for the time and I look forward to any questions during the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie, for that talk. And now we'll move on to our final uh, presenter for this session. Gosh, sorry, I lost my screen just that quickly. We'll be Grace from Snapdragon, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to discuss some of the techniques that we've been working on to get automated, reliable reaction sampling and analysis for data-rich organic synthesis and auto-optimization. 
Uh, at Snapdragon Chemistry, we're a process development company. Uh, and so in particular, we're looking at producing pharmaceutical ingredients and other high value organic reactions. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, so we in particular are interested in using enabling technologies to be able to synthesize these important molecules in a more efficient way and in a superior way, we think. Traditional batch chemistry, as we've been discussing through this whole session, is a, a really, it's a useful way to produce organic molecules, but it's complex to scale and very hard to model. This is because uh, many things change going from the lab scale development to the production scale, such as the mixing, the heat transfer, mass transfer, cycle times. And so this requires many different development periods from lab scale development all the way to production, uh, creating a lot of time and, and using a lot of money. Additionally, this large equipment has a very uh, big footprint, which is gonna increase costs as well. Because there's so much reaction mixture going into these, as well as potentially hazardous materials, uh, they're inherently much more hazardous than the counterpart continuous production. This is just because there's so much energy built up into this mixture uh, that anything going wrong has extremely uh, large ramifications. Uh, it's also difficult to monitor and control these reactions. The variance in things like stoichiometry and reaction time can lead to differences in the product quality, as well as potentially the worst outcome of a failed batch. This all leads to a very high capital cost and a higher cost for the drug production in general. One particular, particular technology that we're interested in at Snapdragon is continuous flow synthesis. So instead of um, dumping all the reagents into a large vessel, we're going to use traditional pumping techniques to uh, introduce the reactants to a continuous reactor. This will undergo some type of reaction conditions such as heating, cooling, light irradiation, and the product will continually come out the back end. This ends up being much easier to scale and allow for modeling to guide our, our production scale design. It also allows for much more rapid development because of that. The, the equipment tends to be significantly more compact, so we're able to produce kilos of material in a small lab hood instead of in a significantly large vessel. Because there's a, so, such a smaller amount of reaction mixture, it is significantly safer and greener because there's less of that highly energetic reaction happening at any time. Uh, it allows also, because we're using so many uh, electronic instruments, we're able to get high feedback control, uh, which allows us to have a very tight control on reaction conditions such as stoichiometry and temperature. Lastly, it ends up being a significantly cheaper production, both for capital costs and, and other manufacturing costs. So with this uh, ability, we also wanted to create a system that would allow for automated reaction synthesis that would allow for something like machine learning or, or auto optimization. Traditionally, organic synthesis, especially in the literature, tends to be fairly irreproducible, irre as well as has um, some discrepancies, such as what are the actual reaction parameters that were completed. So uh, we wanna be able to have a high fidelity data rich experimentation that allows us to feed that to an auto optimization algorithm or keeping the data for other machine learning applications. So we have various uh, requirements for these systems to allow us to really have faith in what we're collecting. First on the chemistry experimentation, we need the reaction parameters to be very precise, controlled and reported so that we can look back on the data that happened and know exactly how much of the reagents we were pumping, what the, uh, the temperature of the reaction was so that if there is any discrepancies, we can then trace back to exactly what happened. Additionally, we need a control system to allow for safe after hours operations. These types of automated operations might take quite a bit of time and we can expedite that process optimization by having this safe control system. 
the sampling and analytical system. So I'm going to be focusing mostly on liquid chromatography here, just since it's really the, the gold standard for organic synthesis optimization. It's applicable to a wide variety of re organic reactions and molecules where something like vibrational spectroscopy like IR and Raman might be faster to collect that data, but it's not as widely applicable for, for many different reactions. So we need our sampling system to be very flexible so it can accommodate both batch and flow reactions. We think this is really important because not all reactions are gonna be applicable to a continuous reaction. Additionally, we wanna be able to accommodate both heterogeneous and homogeneous reactions, as well as a wide variety of reaction parameters such as pressure and temperature. Uh, the analytical system also needs to be very accurate and linear so that we can quantify the results and, and be sure that what we're seeing on our LC is exactly what's happened in the reaction. Our automation system needs to be able to control all of the physical chemistry equipment so that we're sure that the reaction we intended to run was actually run. Additionally, the data from the analytical system needs to be interpreted and passed on to the optimization algorithm. So at Snapdragon, we've been developing the system to be able to control chemistry in a, a very uh, high fidelity way. Uh, so we have all of the equipment that we use, pumps, tubing, mass flow meters, and uh, this really correlates to that schematic where the reactants are pumped through, they undergo some type of chemical reaction, and then we're monitoring what happens with some kind of analytical device. So we want to be able to monitor what's happening for each one of these instruments, things uh, like pumps, mass flow meters, IR, temperature. We want we are monitoring throughout the entirety of the experiment so that we're confident that we are producing the exact quality material that we want. And we think this is very important. Even though continuous flow is more reproducible, we find that equipment is often not performing to the highest ability that it can. And so we need to be able to monitor and make sure that every pump is truly dosing at the exact rate that we want. And so we're able to then control these organic reactions in a way that's giving us extremely reproducible data. So since we've worked together and some fantastic work has gone into developing this system, we know that we can perform these reactions in the way that we want. Next, we want to be able to take the sample from the reaction mixture and analyze it uh, to pass on to the auto optimization algorithm. We're using a small reactor platform that we've developed that allows for a very reconfigurable design um, in inside of a vessel that's controlled very accurately to a specific temperature that allows for heating and cooling. Uh, next, we partnered with Mettler Toledo Easy Sampler uh, to be able to take the reaction mixture out of the reactor and send it to the analytical device. We then uh, made a unit to be able to mix and transport the sample to the analytical device, which we're using uh, Shimatsu UHPLC. We're using this specific instrument and partner, partnering with Shimatsu because it allows for low pressure sample preparation to be decoupled from the high pressure UHPLC. Lastly, these results then go to be interpreted and um, propose a new set of conditions. Uh, here we're using snob fit auto optimization because it allows, it works very well for uh, organic reactions because it allows for a little bit more noisy data to be accommodated. All of this is then controlled uh, with our Snapdragon Lab OS to be sure that everything is operating as expected. So we, we chose to use the Mettler Toledo Easy Sampler. Uh, it's very well used in process chemistry. It has an arm that has a small pocket in it that uh, goes out and then it equilibrates in a batch reactor. And then it takes the, the pocket with 20 microliters of reaction mixture back into the probe, mixes it, quenches it, um, and then sends it to dilution. This is used very, it's, really designed to be used in batch processes, which allows us to use our same system to not only monitor from a uh, continuous flow reactor, but also from any batch vessel. It also, it can be used for homogeneous and heterogeneous reaction mixtures, uh, which would be challenging in, in a flow type valve. 
Uh, it also allows for a wide range of reaction conditions such as pressure and temperature and is made from chemically compatible parts, which is very important to be uh, broadly applicable. Next, um, we wanted to be able to use the same probe for flow analysis. So we designed a, the SNAP cell, uh, which has a very minimal dead volume. We also optimized the fluidic path using computational fluid dynamics to make sure that the pocket is equilibrated in the minimum amount of time. It's also made from chemically compatible wetted parts. Next, after we take the sample from the reaction, it needs to be mixed and transported to the LC. Uh, here we're using low pressure nitrogen to bubble through the reactor and then transport that sample to, to, the, to the LC. Uh, and this really, we wanted to avoid using uh, any kind of valve, like a six-way valve, because in our experience is that those tend to foul quite easily. And so we wanted something that could be reliable and take a sample every time and, and really avoid those types of um, fouling that might happen uh, with a six-way valve. Uh, and then lastly, we partnered again with Chamatsu uh, UHPLC here for the flow vial, again, so that we can add the sample at a low pressure just using low pressure nitrogen to load that sample onto the LC. And then that can just perform its normal operations and take a sample and analyze it. This was predominantly used for drug dissolution studies and it's well used in Japan. So after developing the system, um, here's just a picture of it. It fits nicely onto a cart. We have the Miller Toledo Easy Sampler, our, our dissolution and transportation unit and the, the LC. And so this can be then transported to the reaction of interest rather than having to uh, build uh, some type of unit right next to the analytical device. So after we've produced this, we want to then make sure that it's giving us accurate results as intended. And so one thing we were particularly interested in is making sure that the carryover from one sample to the next is extremely low. Since we're gonna be using some type of auto optimization, uh, we wanted to be sure that if there is a poor resulting experiment next to a high, a high yielding experiment, that there will be no carryover from one sample to the next, distorting the reaction outcome. So we see here through some optimization, we have extremely low carryover from one sample to the next. Our standard deviation is also uh, less than 1% across the entire dilution factor that we're going to be using. So with everything working as intended, we wanted to then apply this to some auto optimization. We began with a fairly simple system where we're doing this SNAR and this nitropyridine uh, with a morpholine nucleophile and added base. These then meet together and are heated to an elevated temperature. The easy sampler is going to take some of the reaction mixture out after it's equilibrated and the uh, Shimatsu UHPLC will analyze the results. Snapdragon Lab OS will then talk to the SnobFit auto optimization uh, to, to see how the reaction perform and propose new experiments. We look at temperatures in between 30 and 80 degrees and 0.4 to three grams per minute. Uh, you can see here uh, some of the data that's collected from the software really showing this uh, amount of data that we're collecting all of the time through this single day. Uh, we see that in blue, we have the, the chiller temperature as it's quickly ramping up and down temperature, meeting, going to the next reaction conditions. Pressure, which is caused just from back pressure through the system is in green. And we see that the pumps are quickly turning on, reaching their set point. The reactor then equilibrates and then the sample is taken, reactors are turned off, uh, the pumps are turned off then to keep, uh, to minimize the amount of, of substrate used. And then here you can see all of the different LC peaks uh, throughout the entire experiment. And we can see that it's quickly going from a poor yielding reactions to high yielding reactions throughout the entire sequence. It completed 35 experiments in seven hours. 10 of these experiments reach full conversion. Um, and then these are just some of the best conditions, which makes sense. Elevated temperatures, high equivalence of our nucleophile. This is what I expected as a chemist. 
We can also try and learn some things about how this reaction performs in combination with all the other reactions. Uh, so we see here that the, uh, the chloronitropyridine uh, at a low flow rate and then at high morpholine equivalents. So it's the top right-hand corner. We see more of these blue p uh, dots indicating a high yielding reaction. Then uh, we see on this graph that on the higher axis on the upper part of the slide, we see more of these blue dots, again, indicating here that the high temperature is leading to better yielding reactions. Next, we wanted to apply this algorithm to something more challenging, uh, a more challenging reaction. So we're doing this lithiation of this dichlorobenzene. And so the desired monolithiation um, is what we were analyzing for quenched with benzophenone as the electrophile. Uh, this can then uh, lithiate multiple times or do a lithium halogen exchange. So there's quite a few different products that can be formed. Both of these reactions happen in the same temperature zone uh, and again analyze after it reaches steady state by the UHPLC. We looked at temperatures in between minus 30 and zero and 0.3 to 3 grams per minute. Um, overall, we completed 69 experiments. So this, and it took two work days. Uh, and this, not surprising, required many more experience, experiments to reach an optimum, since it's a much more challenging chemical space. And you can see that by uh, how many very low yielding reactions, all of the yellow dots in both of these plots basically having no product at all formed. And so somewhat counterintuitively here, we're seeing that the limiting reagent should be the base, the hexalithium, instead of our uh, dichlorobenzene. But because the reaction conditions are so optimized, we're able to get almost complete utilization of the hexalithium, where it's only 0.76 equivalents, but we're achieving a 73% yield on a very challenging reaction. Uh, so we're, we're quite pleased with how this system operates. It's extremely robust in that whenever it means to take a sample, it takes a sample. There's very little fouling. It's a highly controlled system. Um, and this was really only possible uh, with a fantastic group of collaborators, of chemists, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, analytical chemists. And so uh, we haven't had a picture in a while due to COVID, but the team has grown quite a bit he, since any of these pictures. Um, and it's a, it's a really fantastic group of people to work with. And I'll leave any questions for the panel. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that presentation as well. This was a great some great start to our, our symposium. I'm very excited. So um, I would like to remind everyone that we are doing uh, questions via Q and A um, in the in the Q and A function. And so if you have a question, could if you would post it there, I will read it to the um, the presenters uh, for answer. So we do have one question so already on the on the form. Um, how do you handle lack of negative reaction reporting in published data in your scheme to implement databases derived from these publications? Has there been a cultural change to incorporate more complete reporting of negative results so that they can be used in ML and AI approaches? And this is not directed to any, any of you are welcome to answer. I know Connor began things. Maybe we'll start with Connor. Yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, so it's a terrific question, I think. We're all sort of aware of the bias in the literature towards successful outcomes. Those are the ones that make us look good when we publish them. Um, but it's of course very true that machine learning models can learn a lot from you know, failed reactions, which are, can fail for a number of reasons, right? It could be about the chemistry, it could be about the operator, it could be about the humidity on that day. Um, so I'd say that currently because databases lack these negative reactions, all of the data-driven tools that we build to work with the literature data do not even try to make use of that information. So the, the models that we build aren't designed to take that information into account. Um, so I, I've got some models, right, that try to predict the products of chemical reactions and they can't predict no reaction. That's just not possible for them. So I think this will be sort of something that we try to move towards in the future, right, in the next few years to try to shift that culture around publishing negative data. Um, I think to your specific question, I don't think there has been that culture shift yet. Um, but I think it's something that as people recognize the value of 
these types of data-driven efforts, they'll realize that the negative results do actually carry a lot of information and are, are worth including. I mean, I think along those same lines, like one of the, the I mean, it's, it's the, the challenge of how do we change that, that perspective? How do we then accept the fact that we can publish negative things that, you know, when we developed a reaction, we tried this for six months and it failed miserably, um, which is super useful. Um, I mean, one of the things that um, we're going to start doing here is we will um, have completely open um, data. Uh, all of the reactions that we run, all of the processes that we have, uh, we will put online um, so that you can then use all of this um, negative data that's in there that you can actually start to see. You know, yes, you'll then see what we're developing, which is a counterintuitive to the secrecy of our, our selected ivory towers. Um, but it, it's going to be the way forward because if we can do that, then someone else doesn't waste six months trying to do the same thing we did and failing in the same ways. Um, and so it just takes people to do it really. Um, and I think one of the, the things that helps with this is the preprint service as well of, of being able to put out lots of information quickly um, in order to be able to see what, it, what is going on, how this stuff is being developed without the immediate fear of going through four rounds of rejections because reviewers hate the fact that you have a table that's half good and half um, failed results. Yeah, so I think a little of a different response since not in academia and not as focused on publication. And we're really hoping to use this really giant data set that we've collected over the last six years of all of these reactions that were performed, what exactly happened to them in terms of yield or in terms of, oh, this reaction, um, it, it had some type of blockage, et cetera, what, you know, so I think we're trying to use some of this information that we've been creating for years uh, through many different types of chemistries and projects and then be able to apply that in a broader sense. Thank you for that. And another thanks from one of the attendees who asked, for an ML model to be useful in automation loop and flow chemistry, e.g. to synthesize a novel small molecule, I would assume that it is necessary that the ML model generalizes to a wide range of chemical space. Have the speakers any insights, comments in this regard? We don't always have to go in order, uh, but I guess I'll, I'll say that your models don't necessarily have to apply to multiple reaction types. So I think, you know, Carrie described some excellent work sort of focusing on specific chemistries where, you know, perhaps the model is only accurate for those chemistries, but that's okay. And Grace describes um, or mentioned the Stomford algorithm, which I, I imagine they applied to a wide variety of algorithms. And so it's not necessarily tailored to a specific chemical space. Um, I mean, it's, it's the same way that as how we understand chemistry in general. Like there are certain things we understand how we can figure out a cross coupling reaction that are completely irrelevant to photochemical transformations. Um, and, and so if we have from a synthetic perspective access to what you want to run, but then from a um, machine learning perspective, like it, it's fine to have things and you don't need one all encompassing ring to control them all. Um, to have these different branches, I think is it's natural because that's how chemistry actually is. Yeah, I think that was well summarized. I mean, we tend to use these types of block, black box optimization so that we don't really have to tune anything going from one reaction to the next. Excellent. Okay, another question. Since most synthetic reactions are reported in batch, are there any tools that can take a batch that can take batch reactions and give suggested flow conditions? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there, there's, there's, I mean, a for for some things, you know, the the big kind of common misconception about flow chemistry is that it solves all your problems. Um, 
I mean, there, there's a whole world of chemistry that you don't need to run in flow. Reactions that take a long time, things that are forming solids, which are notoriously difficult to deal with in flow. Um, things that, you know, you rely on crystallization in order to drive your, your equilibrium. Like, you don't have to, to do these types of, of processes. Uh, for ones that do, it's then, you know, there is kind of, of you know, thought processes on what are the key kind of considerations and how you would begin to optimize these, these processes. Um, but it, that aspect of things, unless Connor has developed some magical secret that uh, he often does, um, there's not a straightforward way where we can automate that kind of um, thinking. I think there have been a, some like small proofs of concepts um, that that we've sort of played around with here, but I think one of the challenges is that, I mean, it's hard to sort of definitively say what makes a reaction flow compatible or not, right? There's sort of a spectrum of suitability. You know, I, I'd even say that just because you precipitate out many solids and that drives the reaction, you could use a CSTR and still have a continuous process to make it. Um, if you need to use a solid catalyst, put it in a packed bed. Um, if it's a long reaction time, could still run it in flow. So I think, I think it's hard for us to have these sort of hard decision like thresholds maybe for saying what makes something really good for flow or, or really bad for flow because there's a lot of there's a lot of gray areas there. And it just depends on basically what you what you want to do and what you have available. You know, if you have something that is compatible with multiple different techniques, whether it's it's, it's batch or flow, then you get to use what you have. And as long as that data is is reproducible, um, beautiful. You, know, you don't have to use any specific tool. It's the same thing from a machine learning perspective. Like there's not one single thing that's going to allow you to solve all of, of chemistry, whether that is you know how we understand chemistry or how we actually perform chemistry. Um, and so it's, you're gonna need to have multiple different types of, of instruments and approaches and um, utilize these where they, they best fit or what you then have available. Okay, other than, uh, other than synthesis optimization or pathway discovery, can ML help with understanding reaction mechanisms or is, does that still remain in the black box? Um, I, I think it does certainly help because one of the, one of the things you can, you can do is you can start to see the correlation of the, your influential factors with then reaction outcome. Um, and in doing that, we can begin to understand what is influencing and controlling this and begin to then uh, identify, you know, key hyperconjugative interactions in our molecules that are dictating our selectivities. We can then understand better how to design our starting materials and how to guide our reactions through different mechanistic processes uh, that were either too murky to, to figure out on your own or were, were um, unidentified. And so being able to quantify what these influencing factors are and to see how they these factors correlate with, with reaction outcome is, is very beneficial from you know, more of a physical organic standpoint of figuring out what's going on and how do I how do I control this? Another thing, so a couple of things, you can uh, then relate your reaction outcomes to LCMS and be able to pick up key intermediate or impurities, intermediates that might be helpful for mechanistic space. Alternatively, you could uh, feed back all of the data outcome into some kind of kinetic modeling to then determine um, rates, et cetera, for these reactions and, and gain more information about the mechanism there. Okay, along the same lines, what problems need to be solved in order to have full integration of machine learning models and robotic synthesis platforms without human intervention? I think there's, there's probably a, a, few, a few things in the way and I think um, Camille might have a, a pretty good idea of the answer already. She may or may not be a hundred feet from me at the moment. Um, but I think you know, one thing that we need to work on is having more quantitative predictions and quantitative recommendations for for these pathways and for these recommendations. So 
you know, exact quantities, exact actions to take, exact reaction times to try. Um, so that's that's a, a very specific, but very, I would say, um, uh, approachable problem. I think a bigger challenge is trying to improve the analytical chemistry size so we can automatically confirm whether the reaction is running the way it's been intended or whether we've made this new product we're trying to make. I mean, I think that, again, the, the techniques we use for um, analysis on these types of platforms tends to involve LCMS, maybe IR. Um, it's not it's not easy to elucidate new structures with those techniques, and it's it's very possible to build calibration curves to quantify yields. But if you don't want to have to construct calibrations or you know label peaks with retention times, um, it's a little bit trickier to to have that analysis be automated. Um, so I think I think the analytical chemistry is one of the bottlenecks here. Okay, nobody else wants to comment. Actually, Grace, we've got a couple queued up specifically for you. One question is, has Snapdragon considered making the lab OS open source? Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Uh, I don't think so though. Fair enough. Okay, uh, second question is, how can we implement the effect of protonation, uh, i.e. pH effect in our model? Also, is there any analysis of results in terms of stoichiometry of the reaction? More specifically, how can we predict the pathway of the reaction from the results? Or can you? <laughs> Was that also specifically for me? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's challenging. I mean, I think you can... Um, I think one thing we do try to then uh, take this data and then, like I was saying, model that through some kind of kinetic modeling. So uh, we use DynoChem pretty often. And so being able to then relate the, the orders of the reactions to the different stoichiometries and, and understand that. So, um, and another thing that we can do just as a, a snippet is we, didn't, we actually haven't calibrated for any of these compounds going into these reactions. So uh, you don't even need to necessarily calibrate to be able to get a yield assay. And so we can take that uh, kind of preliminary data and then model the, the kinetic outcome and, and understand that form. Excellent. All right, back to everybody. Do you think comparing the performance of AI-based automation tools to human level performance, i.e. expert chemists, would be an important to advance the field? Go ahead, Kerry. I mean, I just say no, um, because I mean, we did this for years, like trying to trying to optimize reactions, try to understand the systems, and you know what is influencing different things. Um, we have so many biases built into what we think is is important, what we think is good, um, and then taking it from a machine learning perspective where you kind of, it's just numbers and it just spits out, you know, what is, is, is happening here. And then you can interpret this. Um, it's generally very different from what we thought is going on <laughs> because uh, we don't understand stuff as, as well as we think we do. Um, and I think if you can build an unbiased approach to these things and kind of start fresh for lack of a better term, I think it's, it's a, a much more rapid way of, of, doing this. I mean, there's this, um, oh, the, work is basically they, they've coded 15 years worth of rules and how chemistry works based on what we, we know and using, um, chemistry experts and how do you can develop this? Like it, it, it can be done. Um, and you can do some very beautiful things with this. Um, but I think if you start from, start from scratch, you can then, minimize the, those kinds of, of biases you're building into these types of, of systems. I think, I think that's a really good point. Um, I, I'll just add that, you know, we humans and automated platforms excel at very different things. Uh, hopefully that's clear. 
Um, and so trying to have a head-to-head -head comparison for any one goal might not be the most informative. So I'd also agree that, you know, broadly speaking, I'd say the answer is no. But for some specific tasks, it's kind of fun to do the comparisons, right? So um, for synthesis planning, like both Marvin Segler and Bartosz Grabowski have done blind and human benchmark benchmarking studies. For reaction prediction, we've done um, human benchmarking studies as well. Um, for, con or for Bayesian optimization, I know um, Abby Doyle recently had and BMS did a human benchmarking study. So it's, it's good and it's fun kind of for PR also just to get a sense of where the field is. But it's, I, don't say, I wouldn't say that it advances the field. It doesn't really illustrate the opportunities for improvement. And it does, in some ways, restrict our thinking to a specific set of tasks for which you know, we're, we're sort of biased um, to, to benchmark. I mean, I think the, the better assessment kind of approach is in looking at how then the job as chemist changes utilizing these types of, of tools. So not necessarily then let's see how well we can replace a chemist, but really then what can a chemist now do with these tools in, in place, you know, with these, these types of, of um, systems, whether it's reaction optimizing or, or uh, route generation or whatever it might be, you know, now that that's there, how does that change your understanding? How does that change your approach to what you are, are capable of developing uh, versus then having to do it all yourself? Because when you're spending most of the time you know, either in the lab doing this stuff yourself or then personally analyzing all of this, the, the data that you're generating, you then don't have the time or mental space to then be creative and kind of doing that problem solving that um, people are so good at. And if you can look at what the role overall changes with these kinds of, of additive um, technologies and approaches, I think that's a better comparison to what a chemist is with or without these types of, of tools. So along the same lines, how close is the day when we can give a molecule to a computer and get the best synthetic route to make it? Three years ago? <laughs> uh, I mean, Connor, go ahead, you, you've done all of this. <laughs> no, I was gonna say there's a heavy asterisk next to best that, that we need. So we can certainly get, get pathways, get suggestions for most molecules if they're very complex. Some programs are not going to do it as well as others. But I, I think once you start talking about the best pathway, you sort of lose all sense of objectivity. Um, yeah. You know, discovery chemists, process chemists have wildly different views over pathway optimality. You know, is it about getting the highest yields, lowest cost, or is it just about making the material quickly with what you have in stock? Um, so I think, you know, again, like Carrie said, for years now, we've had pretty compelling demonstrations, I would say, of computer-aided synthesis planning. Um, but again, the, the best is where the question gets, gets complicated. Okay, so to your knowledge, is there any continuous flow method that can substitute batch style filtration with centrifuges? There's a... Um... What is it? It's a spinning plate systems that they've developed where you can then mm -hmm. separate out solids pretty well um, and basically then act as, as kind of a centrifuge of separating your solids and, and liquids and so on. Um, but even just simple kind of, uh, as Connor mentioned, like CSTRs and things, you can then kind of form and settle out your, your materials in order to separate um, solids from, from liquids. You can even, there's um, examples of, of incorporating um, basically set funnels into, into continuous processes. Steve Lay did this years ago of then being able to separate liquids based on, on densities. Um, so some um, tools out there and kind of, uh, of, you know, conceptual work of showing that this can be, be done. Um, the question is why you would want to have a centrifuge in your flow system. Well, if I get an answer to that, I'll come back. I'll come back to that point. Why would you want to have a, a centrifuge? Um, another question related to synthesis. So overall, how well have the technique, how well have these techniques worked for large scale multi-step synthesis? Are we in the infancy where stages where we're just starting to lar learn more? Uh, 
I mean, a lot of the, the processes that you develop in, in, in flow can be, I wouldn't say easily scaled, but, but scaled in a more straightforward way. Um, as long as there's then that kind of, of stability of, of conditions and things, but we've, you know, taken the, the stuff that we do even in our, our radio synthesizer of these multi-step processes, which is then making, you know, 30, 50 megs of, of product. And you can directly apply those conditions that you develop then to a scaled uh, or kind of dedicated flow system. And then you can uh, make now um, multiple grams in, uh, in an hour of these, these types of systems. Uh, and so they, they absolutely can then be, be scaled and implemented on, on very large scale um, to then also incorporating all the different aspects of, of production. But um, the people at MIT have done this for, for a long time now. Yeah, I would say I would echo that. And I mean, I think a lot of the ways that we, we design how we do the small scale system allows for a very straightforward approach from, um, you know, I would say our small scale is probably only grams per hour, but uh, up to, up to, you know, kilos per hour. And so, what we find is that often those small scale systems are the least well behaved. And as we go to larger scales, things tend to, to work out much nicer. Um, and then also the way that we're designing our small scale systems is that it, it does give us a lot of confidence in how the reactions performed. Uh, so we, we tend to choose these steady state uh, analyses rather than uh, a single slug that might conserve material, which would be good in discovery, but for process chemistry, we wanna make sure that we're really getting a representative sample. Um, so I think, you know, choosing how you're doing your lab scale development can allow for really, really quick and easy scalability. I'm going to go off script a little bit. A question that I had personally coming from the other side, the materials world, where we're dealing with more complicated systems, um, macromolecules, and of course, our biggest nemesis in this is solubility. What do you see some of the limitations are physical or even just the theoretical in using these types of techniques for the synthesis of macro material, macromolecules? So I, I think, mean, cool. you know, oh. Grace, please. Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we do try and design systems that are homogeneous, but we can get really good quality data from using CSTRs with some kind of slurry dosing, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, then we can still get um, high quality data from these continuous systems and then moving on to something like a continuous crystallization or, um, uh, filtrations, et cetera. So I think we have a lot of things that can be used uh, going forward for those types of more challenging uh, poor solubility systems. I mean, they've gotten around a, a lot of those types of, of um, issues from solid phase synthesis. I mean, if you look at, you know, the synthesis of biopolymers has been done in automated fashion since the early eighties. Um, and that is, the same types of, of principles of, of flow, of just doing this then in either, um, you know, a, a sealed reactor that you can then uh, maintain your, your solid phase synthesis in, or doing this in, in a pack bed column, you can also then uh, make these, these types of, of biopolymers in the same way. Um, it comes down to, I think, an issue of scale of how much of these, these types of, of compounds and materials you, you want to make. Um, there's plenty of, of tricks you can play in flow in order to deal with the solids and, and how they form either then from, um, you know, continuous or tank reactors, or you can do this even in, in droplets that, um, you know, because of the, the mixing within each one of these, these droplets, you can continually resuspend and kind of break up aggregation. So you can deal with solids in, in flow, um, at least to, to a point. Um, 
but it then gets down to you know not only um, how much of this material you want, but why is it better to do this in, in flow versus batch? I mean, a lot of materials um, are, are, I would say, more straightforward to make than some multi-step small molecule syntheses um, because they also require some extreme conditions in order to polymerize these, um, these monomer units. Um, Tanya Yunker, though, has done beautiful work with, with polymerizations in flow for a number of years um, of looking at um, how we can deal with these macromolecules in a continuous fashion. Got a reply to why I want to, to do the filtration is the goal is to produce a protein using lysate and then to obtain a purified protein. So that is the, the reason for the desire to filtrate. So well, then the easiest thing would be just to, to set up a um, uh, fraction collector, the backside of this thing, and then add that to, um, you can make your molecules Take your, your pass it through your fraction collector into individual vials and just hook that up to a um, a centrifuge that way. Um, so you can still have continuous processes. You can separate out these to multiple units, but that's a an easy way to incorporate centrifuges if you need to spin this at, at such high speeds to purify lots of different compounds. Okay, more on the purification tip. While liquid chromatography has been the cornerstone for high throughput reaction quanti quantization, LC with UV analysis relies on the analyte's absorption coefficient, which varies from molecule to molecule. In order to be truly quantitative, have there been efforts to improve the global ability for these platforms to quantify without having to acquire a concentration curve for every possible product? I love this question. This is a rant that I couldn't fit into my 15 minutes. Um, for a lot of these high throughput screening platforms, when we're making different products, the performance metric is not actually the yield. It is some uncalibrated peak area or some you know, integrated uh, TIC from the mass spec. So it is really tedious to come up with quantitative yields because it does require calibration curves per product. That's why in the, the Pfizer example I showed, they were making the same product through hundreds of different means so that they could use the same calibration curve there. So I think you know, for UV, we need to, we, we can't really predict extinction coefficients um, and absorption properties with that level of you know, quantitative precision. So I think the shift that we're seeing in sort of high throughput automated workflows in, in pharma at least is a transition to using things like evaporative light scattering detectors or charged aerosol detectors. Right. So these are sort of different instruments you can stick on the end of your liquid chromatography, where ostensibly you can come up with universal calibration curves. So they're, they're not quite as reliable or precise as um, you know, a UV peak area, but they, they offer calibration-free you know, quantitation of, of uh, products outcomes. So, yeah, so ELSD and CAD detectors, I've, I've heard of a number of groups within in pharma starting to use those in their automated workflows for this exact reason. Okay, and, and rant. No. <laughs> That's actually a great question. Having done my fair share of those types of curves, I think everyone would like to not see that if you could get away from it. So uh, speaking of analytical challenges, isolating the final product of a reaction is one way to assess the reaction's performance and grounding LCMS characterization of crude reactions. Plate-based reactions enable an entire set to be isolated. How does that work in flow? Yeah, so I mean, I think I think from flow, you generally, you're, you're gonna need to collect some amount from a steady state reaction. And then you can do something like column purification or crystallization from the reaction mixture. Okay. 
Okay. From the presentations, it seems that people use categorical predictors like solvents, ring substituents, et cetera. Have there been efforts to map categorical predictors to quantitative predictors? A simple example, instead of using a halogen substituent on the benzene ring, using each of the halobenzene's dielectric constant, for example. Uh, that's what we do. Um, so trying to, 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 you know, from figure out what aspect of, of the solvent then is actually influencing the reaction as far as then, you know, dielectric constants or, or um, uh, electro, uh, electrostatic stabilization energies and things like this, um, because it allows us to then more easily extrapolate and interpolate uh, the data into new systems. We get new solvents and new nucleophiles and things like this, and we can quantify exactly how these compare to, to one another and how they relate to, to one another. I'd say generally there's a lot of open questions with respect to molecular representation for these models, right? So you've pointed out a lot of the ones that get talked about maybe the most seem like they're structure-based. A lot of the machine learning methods use these sort of structural descriptors and representations, but there is the whole world of physical organic chemistry that that focuses right on identifying the right continuous quantitative descriptors for molecules, for solvents, for solutes, right? And thinking about their interactions. So um, yeah, people do use both, certainly. I think that there's there's a spectrum that we're still exploring and some ongoing work in our own group is, is thinking about ways to try to merge the two techniques, right? So thinking about ways to combine the calculated properties and the sort of functional properties we can get from quantum mechanics with these structure-based representations and the types of machine learning models that we use for those structural representations. So it doesn't have to be an either or. An additional question is circling back to managing areas where you don't have a large amount of data. Um, so in areas where you don't have um, a lot of information like materials design or various synthesis method, do you find that if you can, how does this, how does your techniques perform or misperform if you're trying to go into when you're trying to broach new terrain? I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, but how translatable is this as what are the knowns to the uh, to the unknowns or, or have you not touched on the unknowns because you don't know a lot about them yet. I mean, I think it. It gets back to the, the idea that that um, you know the way that um, these algorithms are, are trained and these models are, are generated, therefore specific cases, certain reactions uh, or certain areas of, of chemical subspaces, and that those will always have boundaries. Um, and so within the boundaries of the, these systems, ideally, then you have a continuous model that you can now predict things within this multi-dimensional space. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, it's, I completely lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it, it's, <sighs> no, I have no idea what I was gonna say. It was probably nonsense, so I'll shut up. Go ahead, Grace. Yeah, I guess one nuance, I showed two optimizations in, in my presentation. Uh, neither of those sets of conditions were known in the literature. And I ran the reactions both once to make the product, but besides that, the system completely took those away. Um, and so I think it is pretty applicable to something that you don't need to know a lot about. And in some ways, the, the algorithms that that we've all described, at least a subset of them, are really designed to be applied to the cases where we're trying to find out more information and they, they inherently right, have some explorative nature to them. So um, I think in like sort of a, a different scale, um, you know, just thinking about like the broader literature trained machine learning models, that is certainly a case where the field is still exploring, you know, transfer learning techniques and fine tuning techniques to mm -hmm. see, right, can you train on thousands and thousands of Suzuki couplings and amid bond formations and learn anything about, you know, a, a separate reaction that is less well profiled. I think at that scale for those types of models, the answer is not clear. 
Um, but certainly for these experimental optimization routines, they're, they're great in exploring areas we don't know that much about. Well, one thing that jumped out at me and look at in hearing the different talks was, you know, you spend a lot of time figuring out how to optimize the reaction space to, to, to increase the yield. But at the end of the day, a lot of these reactions are of interest for, for different reasons. For example, uh, the pharmaceutical discovery process. Is there a second tier level of connection to say, like maybe, maybe one set of reactions is gonna give you an extremely high yielding project product, but you also know that that set of combinations is not structurally gonna be what's gonna be a, a good drug. So I guess like, is there a mapping on where you correlate what, what is the most synthetically feasible molecules with what is also gonna be the most useful molecules? Is there some, like a second set of, you know, calculations to find that overlapping circle between those two worlds, or are, are you just optimizing yield and then you screen and then you screen for utility? Yeah. So, so I love that question. So that that's that sort of touches on a lot of things that were sort of implicitly behind that that silly scale cartoon that I showed at the beginning. So, making those types of decisions during a a drug discovery campaign about well, this molecule is promising, but really hard to synthesize. This molecule is less promising, but I know I can make it this week and test it next week. Those kinds of decisions, I think, are really, really interesting to think about making quantitative and systematic, right? If, if we use these models to develop this sort of richer understanding of, again, the cost of the experiments, or what will it take to make this compound, then we can start thinking about the information trade off on the design side, right? Which compounds are the best to design taking into account synthesizability and sort of in, in separate work thinking about generative models, which I assume we'll hear about this afternoon. You know, generative models that propose brand new molecular structures usually don't think about synthesizability. And, and that means that their suggestions might not be actionable. They might not be that useful in a practical sense, because it's going to take a whole lot of efforts to figure out how to make the compounds. So I, I, I do think that intersection is super, super interesting. Um, and that's that's definitely a focus um, within uh, within the group here. Excellent. OK, so are there thrusts towards including data from quantum chem, such as energy surface and mechanisms to improve the best synthetic pathways determination? It's the sort of the short short answer is yes. I think that the way in which we do that um, might vary. So, you know, DFT is great and it's convenient and it's relatively inexpensive, but it's not good at quantitatively calculating, you know, solvation energies for charged species. Thinking about solution phase chemistries, it's not reliable enough to to trust entirely. So we're really thinking more about how we can combine the lower fidelity simulation techniques with experimental data to, to learn that mapping from from the simulations we know we can't trust to the experimental data that we trust at least a little bit more um, and, and seeing how we can use that to improve the models but but again hopefully this is an area that that will get touched on in the next session as well okay on the topic of molecular descriptors, how do we know we've captured the appropriate descriptors to yield meaningful predictions other than the predictive outcome making sense from our preconceived notions? It's tricky. I mean, that the, the, the beautiful thing about math is that you get an answer. Um, and so you put it in different descriptors that, that may or may not be um or that may make sense to you um and then you get something out of this but is that the, the you know the the best way of, of describing these types of, of molecules or reagents within this specific you know area of, of research that you're looking at um because that you know there, there's lots of of you know beautiful programming of, of then looking at you know a wide range of Chemoinformatic descriptors of all the possible types of think ways that you could describe this and what actually then fits into um, into that system. 
which I think is is important to begin to to implement because it, in choosing your your descriptors and how you're describing molecules, if you're doing this purely then from a user standpoint of saying I think this is what's important, this is how we can describe our nucleophile best or whatever it might be, um, you're then building in those same biases that you you have, and then you don't necessarily utilize something that it may be less apparent as far as you know how this thing is actually describing the reactivity that we're experimenting and observing. Um, but then from a, a model perspective, it might work best. And that's great. And then from, from our standpoint, we now have to uh, be clever enough to figure out why that is describing this so well and what interaction we're really seeing with this informatic descriptor that is, is being generated and, and utilized in the system. One final, oh, one final question. How useful is the inclusion of quantum chemistry? I was just about to wrap in at the wire. How useful is the inclusion of quantum chemistry information into ML models? For example, how much does the inclusion of computational descriptors improve the accuracies of models or other model parameters? What is the key challenge that we are hoping quantum chemistry information could resolve? In the high data regime, I would say they don't help. These QM descriptors don't help. In the low data regime, they usually help at least somewhat. And the reason is because we're trying to essentially make the learning problem look a little bit more linear. But again, you can you can have really complex descriptors make really complex phenomena linear. And, and Matt Sigmund at University of Utah is a great example. You know, really principal physical organic organic chemistry descriptors make you know selectivity and anti-selectivity questions into linear. Uh, free energy relationships and so that's the role of descriptors and that's why they help in the low data regime because we have then this sort of learned relationship that hel helps us extrapolate and interpolate a little bit more effectively but in the large data regimes if we're screening hundreds or thousands of reactions um, I, I haven't seen that help so much All right. Well, with that, I will wrap up this session.